All right, I, I thought this one would be a short one so there'd be plenty of time for Q&A since we're starting late and the PowerPoint is a little longer than I thought. Tomorrow actually is a short day, <laughs> the functional finance. So if we run out of time uh, or if there's a lot of questions, we can do them tomorrow before we start the um, new topic. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the job guarantee. And uh, in the United States, uh, in Italy, in the UK, there's growing support for the job guarantee. In the case of Italy, it's pretty obvious why. The unemployment rate is very high uh, throughout most of Euro land. The unemployment rate is high. In the United States, it's a little surprising because our unemployment rate, uh, as officially measured, is very low. And uh, if you follow the Fed, the Fed has been worried that unemployment is too low. And so they've started raising interest rates. Um, so the official unemployment rate is below 4%. The true unemployment rate is about 12%, but this is sort of typical. The uh, true unemployment rate is quite a bit higher than the official rate, and I'll get into some of the data on that. Um, we have had falling labor force participation rate of prime age males, especially. Now, prime age is 25 to 54 years old, usually, uh, well, always, even today, this has a higher participation rate in the labor force than any other age group. And males traditionally had a much higher participation rate than females. But it has been declining sharply for males. And we have, um, if you read the American press, uh, a, a growing problem, especially for white males in this age group, dropping out of the labor force, getting addicted to drugs, uh, and this feeling of hopelessness, which is partly reflected in the elections, part of the reason for uh, Trump. There is fear of immigrants stealing jobs. This is a big platform issue for uh, the Republican Party. In the Euro area, outside the major exporting uh, nations, their unemployment rates are much higher than the United States. They are depression levels uh, in Italy, in Spain, uh, in Portugal, especially among young people. Despair and fear of immigrants, very similar to the United States situation, and a reaction against this with growing support for radical right uh, parties there too. Uh, unlike the United States, they have an additional problem which is the fiscal constraints, uh, so that uh, uh, even if they wanted to do something, it would be much harder for them to do it. Causes of unemployment, uh, there are both short run and long run problems that we generally face. In the short run, we have the global financial crisis. The US, after 10 years, has pretty much recovered from that crisis. Uh, in Euroland, the crisis hit a little bit later, but it is much longer lasting than in the United States. We've had fiscal austerity and inadequate response, and so that is part of the reason why it took so long to recover in the US and why Euroland is not recovering. They don't have an adequate fiscal <coughs> response. Uh, really, the only country that responded uh, adequately was China. China got out of the crisis and recovered. Then we also have uh, long-run causes. Dem long-run demand gaps, structural unemployment problems, and the problem of jobless growth. And I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. So in the long run, uh, what has happened really since the early 70s is that the major developed countries start using unemployment as a tool rather than as a problem. It's a tool used to fight inflation. So Bill Mitchell has a very nice book in which he talks about the, um, uh, using unemployment as a policy tool rather than as a problem and switching from a commitment to full employment to a commitment to low inflation. 
And so this has opened up a, a, a permanent, really, demand gap. The demand gap is on purpose. They want to produce a demand gap, keep both fiscal policy too tight and monetary policy too tight to keep a huge uh, unemployed reserve army. Um, then there also is structural unemployment. There's a very nice report from the ILO, International Labor Office, uh, in 2007, and it's very interesting this date because you will remember 2007 was at the peak of the business cycle in the United States and around the world. So this was as good as things get. Okay, so keep that in mind when I talk about the problems they identify. So this is when unemployment was or sh should have been relatively low before the crisis hit. So the ILO says the potential a population has to offer is not always used because of lack of human capital development or mismatch between the supply and demand sides of the labor market. It goes on to say that uh, around the world there were 200 million unemployed people, okay, which was an all-time high, 200 million unemployed people, in spite of strong growth. Every region has to face major labor market challenges, so it was a global problem. Growth fuels productivity growth. So productivity was up 26% over the previous 10 years. We're talking about 97 to 2007. But it doesn't create many jobs. Jobs were only up less than 17%. So we're having jobless growth. We're having growth without creating very many jobs. And the reason is because productivity is growing rapidly. Okay? Uh, for the people who've done history of thought, you know that David Ricardo, in the later editions of his book, started worrying about this problem of machines replacing humans. It's called the machine problem in Ricardo's work. Today, it's the robot problem. Okay, there's nothing new about this. So Ricardo worried that machines would replace human labor and we would have permanent unemployment. Now, for the most part, that didn't happen. It didn't happen because, while well, it's true, of course, machines were always replacing humans, we found new uses for humans. So what he feared, you could argue, really never happened. However, it's come back again. And now the argument is that the robots are replacing humans much faster than we find new things for humans to do. So uh, Larry Summers has been arguing this, and Robert Gordon has <coughs> I would say overall a very good book, a book you should read on um, this, uh, this problem of growth. Now, I think he's got the argument completely wrong, but it's still, the data is great, and a lot of the analysis is worth reading. I think that uh, he is wrong, as Ricardo was. Sorry, which book is this? Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> I, right now, I'm not going to be able to remember the title, but it, it came out about... Three years ago, Sandy Summers. Wrong. No, no, this is Robert Gordon. Robert Gordon wrote the book. Summers has written papers. Okay, this is Robert Gordon. Yeah, Robert Gordon. Okay. I can't think of the title, but it has growth in the title. It's about the United States, but he argues that the the, the U.S. was the engine of growth, and so it's it's American centric. But he argues that there's a reason for that. Uh, and he, he ties uh, growth to innovation. And the innovations, his argument is, came out of the U.S. Okay. Uh, so it's very interesting, but very wrong-headed, I think. Uh, but filled with data you can use. Okay, anyway. Uh, costs of unemployment. Economists, of, of course, will uh, focus on the lost GDP. So unemployment is costly because we lose output. And um, it's, uh, unemployment is, is probably the worst problem that capitalist economies face because the losses are huge. They're much, loss, they're much larger than the losses due to other inefficiencies. Okay? It's a waste of resources. And it's a waste of your more va most valuable resource, which is labor. So they focus on that. <laughs> But the social costs are probably even larger than the economic costs. So they would include things like poverty, social isolation, and crime. Uh, 
Uh, every society has to find something to do with young, unemployed males. They are a huge problem. They get into trouble. Okay, in the United States, we we have well over uh, is it one million or two million? I think it's two million in prison. And it's mostly young males. Um, regional deterioration because unemployment is concentrated. Wherever you go around the world, you will find you know there are areas that have much higher unemployment than the average. Um, health issues, family breakdown, school dropouts, social, political, economic instability, violence, ethnic hostility, because you blame other people for the problem. Uh, in the United States, it's the whites who are blaming the immigrants. Um, even terrorism, loss of human capital, hysteresis, the long-term unemployed become unemployable. Now, this may, it may not be reality, but it's what employers believe. If you've been unemployed for six months or more, they don't want to take the chance with you. So you become unemployable because they won't hire you. Uh, in, the, in the US, what we find is that long-term unemployment has increased a lot. Even though the unemployment rates come down, we have uh, people who have been unemployed for a long time, and that accounts for more and more of the measured unemployment rate. And also, they tend to leave the labor force, so a lot of them don't get counted in the official figures. The benefits of full employment, okay, the obvious one, the one he kind of was focused on, is you get goods and services if you are employed. But, in addition, on-the-job training, uh, most training is on the job. Uh, it's nice that people go to college, but that is not where you learn how to work. You learn how to work once you get your job. Uh, poverty alleviation, community building, social networking, and it's particular kinds of social networks. So people who study this, you know, unemployed people have networks too. The problem is their networks don't lead to jobs. They may well lead to prison. So they've got their networks, but they, they aren't, you know, the kinds of networks that society wants to build. Intergenerational stability, because employed people can take care of the young people and also the old people. You can take care of your parents and your grandparents if you have jobs. Social, political, economic stability, and then um, SIN and Nobel Prize uh, winner argue that there are uh, multipliers. So that the um, sum of the, sorry, the total benefits exceed just adding up the benefits from each one of the things I listed. So you get a multiplier effect of um, employment. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the job guarantee. And there's sort of three different sections. First, a general outline. Then I want to talk about uh, Minsky's approach. And then I will talk about a recent report that we produced at the Leading Institute. So what is it? It's a... Um, alternative to the reserve army of the unemployed. Bill Mitchell is the one, not the only one, but the, the first one that I knew of who uh, made this argument, that um, the uh, job guarantee provides an employed buffer stock. So instead of relying on the unemployed to act as a buffer stock that keeps wages and prices from rising, the uh, people in the job guarantee provide an employed buffer stock, which is also wage and price stabilizing. Um, it's an unconditional offer of a public job at a basic wage to anyone who wants to work. And I'll talk more about what we mean by public job and basic wage later. Because you can uh, define these differently and different proposals will take different approaches to both of these. It maintains continuous full employment in the sense that because it's an unconditional job offer, anyone who wants a job at that basic wage can get one. So that is full employment. Are there people who refuse the job? Sure. Okay. And they may refuse it for a variety of reasons. They might refuse it simply because the wage is too low. Okay. But there is a job offer available, and so on that definition, their reservation is higher than what the job is providing. They're choosing to not work. We don't count that as unemployed. 
main official measures. Um, if you are not uh, taking the market wage, you are not counted as unemployed. It does not replace all labor force programs. So you probably will still need a variety of labor force programs because, um, uh, for example, uh, you may have high-skilled people who really shouldn't be working in this kind of a job at this sort of a wage. And what you need is uh, labor force <coughs> programs to try to place them into better jobs more appropriate for them. Just as an example, uh, the U.S. has been losing uh, automobile manufacturing jobs for I don't know how many decades. Okay, it's not a new thing. It's been going on for a very long time. And some of it is due to imports, but a lot of it is not. A lot of it is just due to increasing the productivity of the workforce. You don't need as many workers to produce uh, the cars that can be sold. Well, those workers were used to very high wages, okay, and it probably isn't appropriate for them to move into this program that pays a base wage, so you need uh, labor force programs to try to retrain them to do something else, other than uh, making cars. Um, the job guarantee uh, enhances macro stability. And I'll be arguing that it does a much better job at this than unemployment does. It's a much better stabilizer than the reserve army of the unemployed. So it's, that's very important for um, our uh, view or vision of what the job guarantee is all about. Full employment um, uh, and price stability promote financial and economic stability. Our argument is that an employed buffer stock is a better wage and price stabilizer than an unemployed buffer stock. Spending in the job guarantee program is countercyclical. It's an automatic stabilizer. Why is it countercyclical? Because when the private sector slows down and lays off workers, they don't become unemployed. They move into this program. <laughs> Their wage might fall. Okay, they might have been earning considerably more than what this program pays. But it doesn't fall to whatever welfare package you have. It falls to the program wage. They are still able to get a job. Government spending will go up automatically because the government is paying the wages in this program. So automatically government spending goes up when the private sector slows down. So it helps to stabilize aggregate demand. On the other hand, when the private sector recovers, starts growing, it's going to need to hire workers out of the program. That means government spending will go down. So the budget automatically moves countercyclically. So it helps to stabilize aggregate demand. And it doesn't require the Congress or the Parliament to do anything. They don't have to get together and say, oh, we need a stimulus package. The stimulus is automatic. The government automatically starts spending more in a recession and spends less in an expansion. So it's an automatic stabilizer, which is much better. The, trying to get Congress to pass a stimulus package that's of the appropriate size is extremely hard to do. Uh, very unlikely they will do it fast enough. This one is automatic. It starts from day one. As soon as the private sector lays someone off, government spending goes up. Okay. It's a high quality anchor that maintains an effective labor supply at the program's wage. And I'll talk about why that will be the minimum wage. It's much better than unemployed. Okay. Unemployed people can't show that they're ready and willing to work. They may develop bad habits. Okay, so there are two things. One is they can't demonstrate that they're employable because they're unemployed. And they may actually develop habits and start to lose skills. If they 
go into the jobs program instead of being unemployed, they're demonstrating they're ready and willing to work because they're ready and willing to work. They're going to work. They have work records that can be supplied by the program. Okay. How many days do they show up? How many days will they leave? And so all of this information can be made available. And um, as I'll talk about a little bit later, they will be receiving on-the-job training. Okay. Now, it, it may not be precisely what the employers are looking for, but at least they're gaining some skills and training on the job. The um, wage paid in the program determines the value of the currency. I talked about this the my first lecture in response to someone from the audience. That um, whatever the government pays in this program effectively establishes the value of the currency in terms of the wage that is paid for an hour of labor. So the government is um, setting the value of the currency in terms of the wage it is paying, which is the basic wage in the economy. The fluctuation of wage income and thus consumption is stabilized. Wage can't fall below this wage floor. No one will work in the private sector for a lower wage than they can get in this program. Okay. Well, I shouldn't say no one. There could be some conditions in which you would. Maybe you would uh, be a starving actor at a very low pay in the hope that you would be discovered. Okay, so there could be some exceptions to that. But generally speaking, you're not going to take lower pay than what you get in this program. And it provides on-the-job training. Uh, as Prof. Uh, Minsky always said, uh, that should be the goal of every single job. Every job that is created in this program should provide on-the-job training. Recently, uh, at the Levy Institute, we put out a report, and I'm going to talk about the details of that. Much of the way that we go about formulating the job guarantee is based on the work of Minsky, who was my professor, and although uh, he didn't talk that much about it in class or in person, um, after his death, I think I said this also in the first lecture, after his death, I discovered he'd written lots on the, uh, what he called Employer of Last Resort program. And so from the very beginning, as we formulated how we would implement the program, we drew on his early work, which was mostly in the 60s and early 70s. So I want to talk a bit about Minsky's approach. In um, the early 60s, Minsky was at Berkeley. Berkeley had a very good labor department in the economics uh, uh, department. Very good uh, labor economists. They were mostly institutionalists. And Minsky had an affinity for institutionalists. Uh, his own training in the beginning was institutionalist, not Keynesian. Um, and the, uh, Berkeley was providing an alternative to the uh, war on poverty that was being developed in Washington by President Kennedy. When, after he was assassinated, President Johnson took over. The advice that they were getting came from the mainstream Keynesians. <coughs> Uh, the uh, Council of Economic Advisors was largely composed of Keynesians, and they were from the elite East Coast schools, Harvard and Yale. Berkeley was an alternative to that, a very different approach and very different policy proposals. So the war on poverty was, according to Minsky, based on aggregate demand management, well, you will recognize that as mainstream Keynesian, F trying to fine tune the economy, pro-investment, 
Whenever you need growth, what do you do? You encourage investment. Very typical mainstream Keynesian approach. How do you reduce poverty? Grow faster. It's a trickle-down approach. It will trickle down, uh, something good will trickle down to the poor if you grow fast. Um, and the War on Poverty adopted this view of how to go about reducing poverty. <laughs> Maybe I better back up and, and, and tell you why Kennedy was so interested in poverty. There was a, a book that came out in 1960, uh, The Other America, that um, uh, argued and demonstrated that uh, in spite of the uh, growth of the U.S. economy, uh, the domination of uh, the global economy, the U.S. was full of poverty. People who were being left behind by the new um, uh, Keynesian um, growth that the U.S. was experiencing. And so Kennedy wanted to uh, try to reduce poverty. So there was a great focus on this. It was, it was exposed, there was poverty all over the U.S., it, people were being left behind, and they wanted to do something about it. Um, Minsky argued that this Keynesian approach would fail. <laughs> It was not going to reduce poverty. The reason is because it was biased toward inflation and financial instability. And so they, they, they might stimulate the economy, but when inflation uh, hit, they would put on the brake pedal. So it was a go, stop, and then go again policy. And furthermore, it would generate financial instability that would create financial crises and maybe recessions on its own. So it was not going to be able to um, continue on a, a growth path that was going to raise uh, people out of poverty. The idea of rising tide lift all, lifts all boats. It's not going to work. Um, in the 70s, and largely for these reasons, the U.S. and other, uh, except for Scandinavian countries, other countries began to abandon any uh, pretense of pursuing full employment. Largely inflation was the problem. Here I just put a sample of some of Minsky's writings. It, it wasn't that he wrote just a couple of pieces. He was preoccupied with poverty, unemployment, and employer of last resort. Uh, you can see for about 10 years, there's 65 to 75. I don't, this is only a partial list, there's more. If you go to the Minsky archives at the Levy Institute, uh, you can scroll through and you can find lots of other pieces that he wrote on the topic. We put together some of these and then additional things in a um, book in 2013 that would collect some of his uh, major writings on this topic. Okay, so what was his approach? He said, a true war on poverty has to include a commitment to full employment. If you're not committed to full employment, then you're not going to solve the poverty problem because a very large part of the poverty problem is unemployment. In, that, in the 70s, I, the 74 paper I think that I listed on the previous page, he demonstrated that if you provided just a minimum wage job to one person in each poor household in America, you would eliminate three-fourths of all poverty. One minimum wage job would bring them up above the poverty line. Okay, so it really is a, an unemployment problem. Second, so you need full employment. Second, only the federal government can provide the program. 
it has to be a federal government program. The state, as the sovereign currency issuer, has the financial capacity to meet that responsibility. It's only the currency issuer that can do it. The War on Poverty got its start under Kennedy, the CEA's primary uh, Council of Economic Advisors. I should have spelled that out for you. Oh, it's in the title. Council of Economic Advisors um, that uh, provided the uh, economic advice for the War on Poverty. Their beliefs were poverty is not really linked to unemployment. Okay, precisely the opposite of Minsky's. Uh, unemployment can be sufficiently reduced through aggregate fiscal policies. Mostly, they're going to rely on fiscal policy to stimulate investment. However, millions have to be unemployed to maintain wage and price stability. You see there's a conflict here. You can't have full employment if you need millions of people unemployed. You can't pursue full employment. So that's why they need that first statement. You have to believe you can continue to have lots of unemployed people and still eliminate poverty. Okay, otherwise this strategy is not going to work. Um, because the Phillips curve had you know, come about in 1960. So they had uh, thoroughly adopted the Phillips curve. And these arguments still hold sway on the right and the left. Uh, so it's obvious the right wing still believes in the Phillips curve, but surprisingly, so does the left wing for the most part. So at the time, Minsky's writing about this in 1965, he says, without a jobs program that takes the poor as they are, the war on poverty will not be successful. Yeah? Sorry, um, like two slides before. Oh. Was uh, so is it 0.3 the escalation for 0.2? Yes. And, yes. So yeah, we need that. the federal and not, not the states? Oh, by state, no. By state, he means the nation state. Okay, this is not the state, not the 50 states. No, nation state. Sorry, I know we use the that term state in two different ways. But, but you said um, it has to be the Fed, I mean the federal. You know, federal government. Government has to be responsible for the full employment. I understood not the states, not the 50 units. Right. So the reason is because the federal uh, government is the one that, you know, can issue currency. Yes. That, that's why. Well, so we're saying it's their responsibility, but can they do it? And maybe not. Maybe they can't afford it. But he's saying that the national government can afford it. Now there is a caveat, and, and I'll get to it, okay, because in 65 we were still on a gold standard, all right, and Minsky recognized that as a barrier. So we won't really have full, full capacity until we go off gold. That's what he wrote in the 60s, all right. So right now we could say, you know, the Italian government has the responsibility but can they do it? Well, probably not. They don't have a sovereign currency. Okay, so maybe the responsibility falls to them, but they can't do it. They're fiscally constrained. Um, that takes the poor as they are. This is also a key point of Minsky. Because the, uh, the war on poverty really did not directly create jobs. It did have job training programs. And it had educational programs, like Head Start, which was targeted to very young kids. The argument of Kennedy Johnson was that if we prepare the poor to work, then they'll be able to get jobs. The poor have problems. They don't have good enough education. And they have behavioral problems. 
we have to change the poor. We have to give them more education and we have to change their behavior. And then they will be able to get jobs. If we are increasing aggregate demand. Okay? Uh, so Minsky says that's the wrong approach. You have to take the poor as they are. Give them a job and give them training on the job and change their behavior with employment. You can't ask them to get educated and trained and change their behavior and then we will give you a job. Okay? The war on poverty is a conservative rebuttal to an ancient challenge of the radicals that capitalism necessarily generates poverty in the midst of plenty. Now normally you would think, Americans thought, that the war on poverty was a very liberal thing. We're going to help the poor. Minsky says it's conservative. It's a conservative approach. Now keep this in mind when we briefly talk about basic income guarantee. Minsky would see the basic income guarantee not as a liberal proposal, give everybody income. That's a conservative proposal in Minsky's view. Why? It is saying that capitalism um, has no solution to this problem. Okay? We can't let you fully participate in the system. Maybe there's something wrong with you. What we're going to do is give you some money instead. You're not going to fully participate. We're going to give you some money. That's a conservative response. Minsky would say, no, we need to change capitalism. People don't have to change. Change capitalism. That is a progressive response. There's something wrong with capitalism. There's not something wrong with poor people. There's something wrong with a system that leaves them behind. So we change capitalism. How do we change it? By the government getting involved directly and creating jobs. So Minsky died before basic income guarantee came back. Now it existed in the 70s, early 70s. But it came back in a big way in the past three or four years. Uh, so he's not here, but I, I know what he would say. Minsky was very opposed to welfare. Very opposed. And I always thought this is a very strange thing. Because, you know, I was a, a radical student. And here was Minsky always arguing welfare is terrible. We have to get rid of welfare. Well, that was Ronald Reagan. Minsky sounded a lot like Reagan. I never really understood why. He was so opposed to it until I discovered all of his writing. Okay, and then it made perfect sense. That's the wrong response. That's a conservative response. So welfare is not liberal. It's conservative. We need to change the system. Don't just throw money at people. Okay, instead of providing the impoverished with an opportunity to work, it provided them with an opportunity to learn how to work. So that's why it's conservative. Um, the preferred strategy has been tax cuts to business to encourage investment. Okay. And if you look at the Kennedy stimulus programs, and ever after the Democrat uh, stimulus will typically be tax cuts for business, okay. not spending more. It's generally tax cuts. Okay, that's generally been even the Democrats' response, but also the Republicans. So in other words, they, they don't really differ in their approach. When you want to stimulate growth, what do you do? More tax cuts for business. In contrast, an expansion led by, the, oh sorry, the, an expansion led by the private sector increases private indebtedness and financial fragility. So what is wrong with the tax cuts for business? If any policy that favors investment is going to tend to be inflationary and increasing financial fragility, according to Minsky. Because it increases indebtedness. In contrast, an expansion led by the private sector actually enhances stability by providing safe assets um, and generating income flows. So Minsky preferred spending by the government rather than tax cuts. But he wanted the spending to be targeted. He didn't want general pump priming. He didn't want more spending on the military. He wanted targeted spending targeted to creating jobs. 
So alternative policy weapons that are sufficient to move an economy from slack to full employment are not sufficient to sustain full employment. Okay, in other words, even if the tax cuts do stimulate investment and move you to full employment, you won't be able to stay there. So that policy might get you to full employment, but you can't sustain it. Why? You start getting inflation, so the government cuts back in spending or raises taxes or raises interest rates, and financial fragility. So you get a crisis and you slow down. So you have to have a different strategy if you want to maintain full employment. So the tax cuts and investment stimulus might get you to full employment, but won't keep you there. You need a different kind of strategy. <coughs> Private investment strategies can't make sustained strides in a war against poverty. His alternative was high consumption fueled by policies that increase jobs. So this isn't uh, an anti-ecology argument when I say high consumption. He doesn't mean he wants everybody to go out and, and consume everything and destroy the environment. What he means is consumption to be a higher percent of GDP and investment to be a lower percent of GDP. Okay. So it's just relative to GDP. It's not uh, consume, uh, everybody consuming a lot. Um, and he wanted that consumption to be financed by wages. So we need high employment uh, with growing wages so that people are not using debt to finance the consumption. Further, government spending should play a major role in generating growth. Uh, his policies favor greater equality and greater stability. All right, he called it employer of last resort. He didn't come up with this. The term was used in the 1930s, and who knows? Maybe it was used before that too. I don't know, but it definitely was used in the 30s. Uh, Minsky uh, worked in a, a New Deal job creation program. He was in the WPA, which was our biggest one the Works Progress Administration. Um, he was hired into that, he was unemployed, hired into the program. He actually was um, the, uh, an assistant to Douglas of Cobb Douglas Production Function fame. Douglas employed Minsky to estimate Cobb Douglas Production Function. This was a WPA project. Douglas went on to become a very important U.S. Senator. Minsky remained friends uh, after he left academic, after Douglas left academics and moved into government as a Senator. Um, so anyway, he called it employer of last resort. Federal government funds a job guarantee program, setting the wage and offering a perfectly elastic supply of jobs. Minsky always argued in class, only the national government can provide a perfectly elastic supply of jobs because it doesn't have to make a profit and it can't run out of money. That's why it has to be the national government. Advantages eliminates the kind of poverty that's due solely to joblessness. Okay, will poverty remain? Yes, it will. Some people can't work. Some people don't want to work. Some people shouldn't work. So you're still going to have poverty, but you will eliminate most poverty. And then you have to deal with the rest of the poverty in a different way. Okay? If people don't want to work, offering them a job is not going to solve their poverty problem, or if they can't work. Whereas the investment strategy raises demand for specialized labor, hoping jobs trickle down to the low skilled, the employment strategy takes the unemployed as they are and tailor makes jobs to their skills. Okay, so the uh, typical Keynesian approach, Joan Robinson called it military Keynesianism. What do you do? You pump up the military, which means you're hiring the best skilled workers. You are hiring the engineers, and so on. Typically, the government is not directly hiring them. It is paying private firms to hire them. Those private firms are the most advanced firms in the economy, the military-industrial complex. The workers are highly unionized. So you have a combination of, on both sides, you have price setting. The firms are price setters. 
and the workers are unionized and they have uh, power over wages. So you're going to be causing inflation. Okay. You will get inflation long before jobs trickle down to the low skilled workers. That's the problem. That's why it will never lead to full employment because you will put on the brake before you, the jobs ever trickle down to the poorest part of the population. So instead what you need to do is take the unemployed as they are and create jobs that they can do. So it's a very different approach to achieving full employment. Instead of hiring off the top, you're hiring off the bottom. You don't hire the high skilled, you hire the least skilled people in the program. If a tight labor, you're creating a tight labor market, although it's not as tight as uh, the Keynesian approach, because that makes extremely tight labor markets for all of the most desirable employees. This one makes tight labor markets in the sense that anyone who wants a job can get one at the basic wage. Um, if the tight labor market draws additional workers into the labor force, the number of workers per family increases and moves families above poverty um, who were uh, near it. So you can have more than one worker per family, and if you offer um, both full-time jobs and part-time jobs, <coughs> Many families might choose to have one full-time worker and one part-time worker, and that will help to increase their wages. Tight labor markets improve the distribution of income among workers. Jamie Galbraith, uh, uh, around 1998, had a very good book that also argued this, that uh, the distribution <coughs> of wages improves when labor markets are tight, as you near full employment. Uh, so market processes raise the wages of low-income workers faster than the wages of high-income workers. Minsky wanted the government to bias uh, wage growth in that manner. So he wanted to try to reduce the rate of wage growth at the top below lab labor productivity growth. And then increase wage growth at the bottom above average labor productivity growth. That would help to uh, compress the uh, difference between high wages and low wages. He wanted that to be a policy. How can the government do it? Well, the government is, is a, a purchaser of the output of the highly unionized sectors, and Minsky wanted them to use their purchasing power to try to um, control wage and price increases. And then at the bottom, the, the wage in the program is set by policy. It's not a market wage. The government can increase that wage a little bit faster than labor productivity grows. That was his goal. Um, he believed it's possible to decrease the labor profit inequality by decreasing capital share of income. How do you do that? Well, you switch from trying to stimulate investment to stimulating consumption by creating jobs that will increase the wage share and reduce the profit share. Uh, the Koleski equation shows that uh, an increase of investment increases profit. Okay. So we're going to be reduce, reducing our focus on stimulating investment and that will reduce profits and reduce the profit share. Finally, a public employment strategy frees policymakers from the overriding need to induce investment through tax incentives. So, for those of you who've read Keynes's chapter 24, he has some proposals and um, he says that uh, what we need to do is find an alternative to uh, the conventional approach, which is always to try to make business people happy. The problem is that we rely so much on private business people being optimistic in order to get growth and try to solve um, unemployment problems that we're always catering to, the, to business. Okay? I don't know about Brazil, but in the United States, every proposal that you have is, well, how will big business view this? Are they going to support it or not? 
You know, everyone's just deathly afraid they're going to make business unhappy about something, right? Keynes was very worried about this all the way back in 1936. Minsky's worried about it too. We need to find another way. You shouldn't rely on keeping big business happy to have a decent living standard and jobs for everybody. Okay, I'll, I'll say a few words here and probably some of you are going to you know, want to have questions about it. Uh, employer of last resort or job guarantee and um, well they have very different views of the social and individual value of work okay if you talk to <coughs> anthropologists sociologists people who work in the, the uh, health they will tell you that <coughs> being involuntarily unemployed is extremely bad for individuals and for the societies they live in. Because unemployment is concentrated and so you will be talking about you know, areas of your city with very high unemployment. It's extremely bad socially, not just individually. It goes way beyond not having income. Okay? It's very demoralizing to live in a society where uh, you are expected to work for income, okay? But even if we weren't organized in this way, contributing to society is extremely important to people. Being a productive member of society is extremely important. Participating in work helps you participate in um, socially in many other ways. Okay, a very large part of your social life is centered around your work, your workplace and after work. People who are unemployed don't have that. So just giving income is ignoring the social and individual value of work. Uh, in addition, there is um, uh, the production system. Okay, if we're saying that uh, work isn't valuable, we're saying that the production of workers isn't very valuable. And the uh, providing a decent standard of living Without, provide, without requiring work, that is, you're just going to provide that to everybody, is going to have an impact on the production system. If everyone can choose not to participate in the production system, then where is the production going to come from? Uh, the, uh, I mentioned Hefe's here, uh, Argentina had this Hefe's program, I assume most people are somewhat familiar with it, and um, I went down three times to uh, look at the program. Uh, one of the times uh, we went to interview uh, women working in the program. We interviewed about a hundred women who were working in the program. and. Uh, we had a list of questions we were asking, Pavlina, Chernova, and I. And uh, one question we asked him, what's the best thing about this job? We expected that they would say something about the income that they got. Virtually nobody gave that answer. The number one answer, by far and away, was I get to produce and contribute to society. That was the number one um, a positive thing that they got out of the program. It's very surprising uh, to us. We, you know, we knew that it's important to people, but that virtually everyone listed that as the most important thing that they did, that they got out of the program, uh, was surprising. The contribution to society. Political sustainability, uh, participating, uh, in employment and uh, being in social networks helps to contribute to political stability too. 
as far as the um, reserve army of the employed, it is helping to stabilize wages and stabilize inflation. If you are simply providing a big basic income guarantee without requiring work, and you're giving this to everyone, you are providing a very large increase in aggregate demand without increasing aggregate supply. You may be reducing aggregate supply if people are deciding that uh, with the basic in income guarantee and a guaranteed reasonably good living standard, at least some people will choose not to work. So at best, you're not increasing aggregate supply, and more likely you're reducing it at the time that you are greatly increasing aggregate demand, if you are really offering a basic income guarantee. Maybe I should say what, what I see a basic income guarantee as being which is an unconditional, that is not means tested, everybody gets it, an unconditional grant that provides a basic living standard to every individual in society. That was the original idea of the basic income guarantee. It's not tar targeted and it provides a reasonable living standard. Okay? Um, so, uh, in the United States, that would probably be twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars each, which will amount to somewhere around fifty percent increase in income of households. Well, that is a very large increase without providing. Uh, a commensurate increase of GDP. It's going to have to lead to an increase of prices. Maybe not by 50%, uh, but a significant increase of prices. Now, if you are guaranteeing a living standard, you've got to increase the basic income guarantee. So it may be $25,000, and then when prices go up, you've got to increase it. Maybe not by 50%, let's say $10,000. You've got to go to 35, which is increasing aggregate demand again. You have not created a new kind of buffer stock to try to hold down wage and price increases. You don't have an employed buffer stock. You have an unemployed buffer stock, but that unemployed buffer stock is all receiving income. That will provide them with a decent living standard. I can't see how this isn't a recipe for a wage price spiral. Because there's no incentive here to increase employment. The reserve army of the employed, on the other hand, is providing the buffer stock you need. Yes, it's increasing income, but the people in the program are not lost to private employers. You can always hire them out of the pool by paying a slightly higher wage than what is made in the pool. They're, they're employable. So as aggregate demand goes up, you can recruit from that pool to increase production to match the increased demand for the output. With the basic income guarantee, you haven't created this residual pool. What you've done is you've reduced the incentive for the already unemployed to actually take the job because they're getting the basic income guarantee whether they work or not. Which of those two scenarios is going to be more inflationary? To me, it's obvious. I can't understand the argument that the basic income guarantee will not be inflationary. It's got to be inflationary. Um, 
you are providing training and education on the job because you're not providing jobs. With the Job Guarantee Program, you're providing training and education. In the best case scenario, you're providing it to every single person who works in the program. Okay, now, are we going to get the best case scenario? No, we're not. Okay, I'm realistic. There will be people who work in the program who aren't getting any additional skills or training. But at least some people are. So at least some people are enhancing their skills and training and they're becoming more desirable to the private sector. Okay, and uh, just to return, you're not destroying the production system at all with a job guarantee. The job guarantee program can exist beside the productive system. We're employing people to do things. We're not destroying the productive system. We're actually increasing the, uh, the private sector's desire to produce output because we have additional sales we can make. Okay. And best case scenario, the people working in the job guarantee program are producing useful things. Now, again, I'm realistic. Will every single person, uh, every single project that's undertaken by the Job Guarantee Program produce things that are useful for society? No. There will be some jobs that uh, are not successful, they're not going to, but many of them will. What kinds of productive activities I'll, I'll get to later, some of these will actually enhance the prospects for the private sector. Okay. For example, public infrastructure will make it easier for the private sector to produce. So you actually will be um, doing things that help the private productive sector become more productive. All right. A lot of the jobs won't be designed to do that. But they will increase living standards uh, for the communities. It won't necessarily benefit private enterprise but it will raise the living standard of the people who live in, in the communities that are benefiting from the programs. Maybe they're providing parks or public safety in the parks. Okay, well, that's not necessarily enhancing the private for-profit sector, but it is raising living standards. People have better lives if they have parks that they can enjoy. All right. So it's sort of outside the market system, but it still is improving people's lives. The um, basic income guarantee, I know there, there are lots of claims that uh, David Graeber is a friend of mine, he, you know, he's very uh, much in favor of this. Well, we're gonna unleash the creative spirit of everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm very skeptical. We, we know what Americans do when they uh, become unemployed. They watch TV and they sleep. I'm serious. This is what they do. Okay. Now they, it could have unleashed their creative spirit, but it doesn't. They sleep and watch TV. Okay. And you know, then there's there's a reason why we value art because it's uncommon. It's uncommon. Everybody is not artistic. And uh, the idea that suddenly everybody is going to be out there creative and creating art that we all want to enjoy, I'm just extremely skeptical of this. Um, people who don't have jobs sleep. Okay. And uh, uh, can get in trouble. But that probably is largely related to not having income. So I'm not saying that. Um, big is going to increase crime, may well reduce crime. Um, full and how are we doing on time? It's five? Okay, I'll keep going. Um, growth by itself is not an appropriate goal. Uh, Economists have sort of convinced us that you know this is what economies should strive for is growth, but 
growth doesn't create enough jobs, this was the ILO's complaint. Okay, we can have relatively good growth and rising unemployment. It can promote rising inequality. I'll show some data. Growth actually increases inequality. Uh, the Keynesian economists of the 60s were very optimistic about growth. Growth, uh, the rising tide lifts all boats. And Keynesians believed that for a long time. It turns out it's false. <coughs> growth benefits the already well off. And when uh, my former student and colleague now, Pavlina, um, first started putting these graphs together, I said, well, of course that's true. You know, if you think about it for a minute, the powerful are the ones who are going to reap the benefits of growth. The weak aren't. So it makes perfect sense that growth actually enriches the already rich. It really doesn't help the poor. So by itself. It promotes financial instability, and now uh, everyone's concerned about uh, the environment. It can harm the environment. Full employment through employer of last resort promotes shared prosperity because growth is sort of the residual. Let's provide a job to everybody, and if we grow, fine. So if the growth will be shared because what we're doing is hiring off the bottom. It can, it can lead to an environmentally sustainable development path. That should be the goal of the jobs that are created. Since the jobs are created through policy, not through the market system, you can choose to make the jobs environmentally sustainable. You can use the program to increase environmental sustainability. Um, and it uh, contributes to price and currency stability because you are helping to stabilize wages, and by currency stability, what I mean is sort of the same argument that I was making before. You are establishing the value of your currency in the wage that you're paying. And that will help to stabilize the value of your currency externally, too. Stabilizes it internally, and also helps to stabilize it externally. Okay, finally the caveat. Uh, Mitski anticipated high in the sky objections against spending, deficits, easy money, and we have to ignore those. Uh, the ELR program is less inflationary than the current system, pump priming is not sustainable, and the one barrier we face, we call the cross of gold, this goes back to um, the late 19th century, the gold standard, I don't need to read the long quote. He says, the solution to the gold standard barrier is simple, get rid of the gold standard, which we did a few years after he wrote that. So that removed the final barrier, and his argument was, this is a pie in the sky. This is something we can do. All right? Countries that peg are still constrained, so we do have to consider that. Inclusions. Poverty is largely an employment problem. Tight full employment improves income at the bottom, because that's where you're doing the hiring. Uh, it will help to sustain tight full employment. Oh, that was it, honey. Okay, I'm gonna move into now our modern version. So this is all from Minsky's early writings. It, I talked about um, the development of modern money theory a little bit. Uh, Warren Mosler had essentially come to the same conclusion as Minsky on his own. He had never read Minsky. He had never read any academic literature, really. Uh, he didn't know that there had been a proposal of employer of last resort or anything. But he independently came up with the realization that first, um, Unemployment means the federal budget deficit is too small, so we have a problem of effective demand. And second, the value of a currency is determined by the prices paid by that government. So Warren is going beyond 
what I was arguing, that the job guarantee program sets the value of currency equal to the wage, the hour of labor you get for, let's say, $15 in the program. Warren argued that since the government is imposing a tax on the population and it is issuing the currency that people need to pay the tax, the government can set the conditions in which it will provide the currency. So the government is going to buy stuff from the private sector. Why? Because it, the government needs resources to pursue the public purpose. The government can set the price of everything that it buys. Because the population has to have the currency. And so we could just carry it to an extreme. If the government said that, um, you know, we're going to buy an aircraft carrier. I use this example in the 98 book. We're going to buy an aircraft carrier. And normally, I don't know what it is, a billion dollars. The government says, we're only going to pay one million. We don't like paying a billion. We want to increase the value of the currency. We're only going to pay one million. But, of course, nobody's going to offer an aircraft carrier for a million if they've been expecting a billion. What happens? Well, nobody can pay their taxes. The prices are going to have to fall before the population can get the currency that they need to pay the tax. If the government is willing to cause massive deflation, they can get the prices down to where they want them. It, it is the price setter because the population needs the currency to buy the tax. So I was purposely using an extreme um, example. The uh, government doesn't need to set the price of everything that it buys, but it can use its pricing power strategically to try to stabilize the currency. So what you want to do is set the price of the most strategic resources in the economy. Oil, the government can be a price setter for oil, so you will only pay this price. And labor, those are two of the most important, uh, well, labor is the most important resource. So the government can use its pricing power strategically to try to help stabilize the value of the currency. I, I, personally, I would use only the job guarantee program in a country like the United States. Okay, this will be enough because we don't have a huge problem with inflation. And in other countries, there might be other commodities that you want to try to strategically uh, influence the prices of those. From the very beginning, there has been this objection uh, that uh, post-Keynesians use. Kolesky, I, I suppose, uh, a brilliant article, but uh, it was for a particular time. Okay, it's outdated, I think. The premise that the government of a capitalist state will maintain full employment, if only you will know how to do it, is by no means obvious. So he's arguing that there are two big problems with um, trying to propose that government maintain full employment. Uh, first, you need a reserve army of the unemployed to stabilize wages. Well, a reserve army of the employed will do an even better job. Okay, so I, I don't think that this objection is valid if you're talking about a job guarantee. Now, if you're ju just talking about general Keynesian policy, I absolutely agree that this is a problem. Keynesian uh, pump priming is going to cause inflation unless you maintain a reserve army of the unemployed. But if you're using directed spending, 
uh, you don't need a reserve army of the unemployed. The second objection that Kolesky raised was, you know, who is going to pay the taxes to finance full employment? Obviously, it can't be poor people. It's going to be higher income people, and they are more politically powerful, and they're going to prevent it from happening. This is the basic argument that's raised. Well, the sovereign government can't run out of currency. They don't need to impose a tax to uh, implement a job guarantee program. You don't need any new taxes. I'll go through our simulations uh, to show that what we've claimed all along is true, I mean, as far as a simulation can tell you. Simulations are simulations. It's not the real world. But it does give you some uh, uh, sort of an external verification. Job guarantee programs can be implemented without imposing new taxes. So it's not that we're going to have to convince the rich to pay more taxes before we can have full employment. We don't need more taxes to implement a job guarantee program. All right. So maybe at this point, I'm, I'm going to go into our um, proposal and simulation. At this point, if we need a break, we should probably do it now. I'm not sure if we need a break. Okay. Uh, maybe we can go through in the, because we started late. Otherwise, I'm okay. not sure if you guys need a break or. Me? I don't need a break. No, you, the students, you can say. Okay, so okay. I, I, I know that I, I can do this in 25 minutes because I had to do it at the Minsky conference. Mm -hmm. However, uh, there are uh, a few additional slides from what I did there. Okay. So, why uh, every uh, Democratic uh, presidential candidate has come out in favor of the job guarantee? It's pretty amazing. Okay. Before this point, no one ever came out for it. And now suddenly the main candidates have come out for job guarantee. And we have less than 4% unemployment, which all the economists are telling them is beyond full employment. We already need to slow the economy down. And they're all coming out for a job guarantee because we have such a problem of unemployment. How can that be? So uh, I'm going to present some data why uh, they would be supporting this when apparently we don't need it. First is, the recovery was so slow. The recovery of jobs, I mean. Uh, this graph, you can study it on your own later, just shows our um, recessions and then the recovery of jobs when you get back up to zero, you finally have recovered the jobs you lost in the recession. And pretty much it's true, every succeeding recession, it takes longer to recover. Our first jobless recovery was Bush Sr., the 1990 recession. It was the first time that we had a recovery in terms of GDP, but not a recovery in terms of jobs. It took many years to recover the jobs. Every recession since 1990 has been a jobless recovery. The economy apparently recovers, but we didn't get the jobs back. Okay, so people start to feel this, okay, that unemployment is more of a chronic problem. Um, I don't know if this is going to work. This is something um, Alvina came up with. If it's slow, I'm going to skip it, but it is interesting. So 1990 to 2016, black is high unemployment areas. This is a recession and then recovery. This is the Clinton boom. This was the best it had been since 1960s. The little recession. And this is a boom. And now the global financial crisis. <laughs> and 
and then we start to recover. You can see there's still a lot of black, 2013. Okay, so 2016, yeah. Pretty much back to where we were. Uh, this is Pavlina's uh, graph. This became famous. It was everywhere in the U.S. This one is bottom 90% and top 10%. Every recovery from a recession, all, going all the way back, the um, gains to the top increase. Their share of the gains, they go to the top 10%. She's also done this with 1%, and it's true for the 1% too. In a way, it's more true. It's not quite as dramatic. They're not getting 100% uh, of all the gains from uh, the recovery. But in uh, these last um, two, they've got uh, virtually all the gains go to the top 10%. This shows uh, the unemployment rates rising, coming down, rising, coming down. Uh, the official unemployment rate today very low. Well, it's even lower than this now. This is a, a broader measure, and this is one that uh, Flavia Dantas and I uh, came up with. So it's still, the point is it's still high. So the official measure is very low we find it's more like 13%. Um, this shows participation rates by age. Um, you can see that from a peak, it's been declining, and even though this is 2016, we're still not back where we were for um, the uh, all group and the female group. Here's the male, prime age. It's down since, on a downward trend since 1970 and sharply down here. So we have this problem with males in particular and people have tried to come up with explanations for why our uh, labor force participation rate uh, uh, has stagnated overall, come down a little bit overall, and declining for men. Uh, if we compare ourselves to OECD nations, we're very unusual. Okay? Most of them have actually higher participation rates than us for prime age. This includes women. And most have had rising labor force participation rates between 90 and 2015, we're one of the few that actually has falling labor force participation rates. And there's something strange going on in the U.S. Um, this is the duration of unemployment and the labor force participation rate. Um, the uh, long-term unemployment is correlated with a falling labor force participation rate. So as unemployment on average is longer, our more and more people leave the labor force. So the labor force participation rate comes down. This one is age groups, which shows um, just, you, you can look at these, you can see for men it's coming down. People say that the reason why labor force participation rate is coming down is because people are retiring. Well, if you look at our aged group over 55, they're actually increasing their labor force participation rates. They're the only group that has increased labor force participation rates in the last decade. So they're actually uh, continuing to work longer. They probably can't be uh, retiring. Demand side explanations, um, falling demand for middle and low skilled workers, this is the CEA, there's some truth in that. Lack of jobs at decent wages, some truth in that. Overall economic performance, chronically insufficient aggregate demand. 
uh, economic growth doesn't create enough robots. This is the Larry Summers robots uh, uh, explanation. Robots take the jobs away. On any given day, just about one out of every six men of prime working age has no paid job of any kind. So for all of these reasons, people realize the official unemployment rate isn't telling you what you need to know. We have a lot of people outside the labor force, especially prime age males. Is the labor market tight? So this is another way to, to look at uh, the official unemployment rate and um, how misleading it can be. If we really had uh, a low unemployment rate, if labor markets are really tight, wages should be going up. That's basic economics. They aren't. Um, the nominal hour wage has barely picked up, running just a little bit above the inflation rate some uh, quarters. And in spite of productivity growth, real wages are not rising. Okay, this is, Rick Wolf has been going around giving this picture. So what we did was um, put together a report. We knew that uh, Bernie Sanders was going to come out for the job guarantee. We didn't know the other were, but we wanted to have a um, report and a simulation ready uh, for uh, Bernie's announcement. It turned out everybody came out uh, even before we put out the report. But once we put it out, a lot of them were um, picking it up and quoting it. So we based it on Minsky's employer of last resort, and uh, you can read it there. Uh, it has to be permanent. The problem with the New Deal was they created 13 million jobs in the New Deal, which was a lot, significant, uh, compared to the size of our labor force. Of course, the Depression was terrible. We had unemployment at 25%. But when we re recovered, there was pressure to get rid of it, and we gradually phased it out. So we have to make sure it's permanent. It's not something you implement in a downturn and then get rid of when things improve. It has to be universal, so jobs for everyone, jobs for every community. Everybody uh, can get a job and every community has jobs in their community. So one uh, uh, problem with the New Deal was that some of the programs had projects that the workers went to, they left the communities. So for example, we had the Civ Civilian Conservation Corps. Young men went out and they worked in the National Force and so on. That's fine, but you want the communities to see the results of the projects in their communities. So it's very important, every community has projects. And the jobs have to be good jobs and good wages. So we proposed a permanent program, made it part of a bold structural reform agenda. Federally funded, but locally administered. So unlike the New Deal program, which was administered from Washington, ours is gonna be very decentralized. Every community will put forward projects. Uh, there are uh, a number of reasons for this. Uh, Minsky used to say, you know, I wonder if we have the competence to implement a New Deal program anymore in Washington. Does the competence exist? Now, he didn't even live through Trump. Uh, you know, it, it's just inconceivable that Washington could run a program that's creating jobs in every community in the United States. It's just not conceivable. There could be countries where the central government is competent and could do this. But in the United States, I don't think it can be done. Uh, the local communities know who the unemployed are, and they know the kinds of projects they need. 
So it makes more sense to decentralize. Further, the, the New Deal was really remarkable because there was very little corruption and there was no corruption in the jobs programs. None. None has ever been exposed. Now there was this discrimination. There was discrimination against African Americans. You know, that was terrible. But there wasn't corruption. Um, corruption you know, is rampant in Washington now. There, there, there are no programs that aren't full of corruption. So the problem with corruption is that when it's exposed, and if the program is run in Washington, it's going to taint the whole program. Okay? You're going to find some corruption somewhere, and then the whole program will be tainted. If you decentralize, will there be some corruption? Yes, there will. But it's going to be localized. It's going to be some local community where the government, the local government, or a local uh, NGO uh, is corrupt. Okay, and then you exclude them from the program, you eject them, the rest of the program remains. So that's, I think, another reason for decentralization. Universal access, voluntary employment opportunities on demand, open to all people. So not like the New Deal, which discriminated on the basis of race. Uh, also, some programs were for men. Uh, this one will uh, provide jobs to anyone who wants to work. They will pay $15 an hour. Our minimum wage is half of that right now in the United States. So this is doubling the minimum wage. There is a movement to raise minimum wage to $15 an hour. So that's why we chose this number. There's already a movement, and this will give us that. Basic benefits, and the basic benefits are generous. It's going to be um, medical care. In America, you probably know, uh, Americans don't have a universal uh, medical care. This will give us one. Everyone in the program will get it. Um, and other benefits, too. An employment safety net, transitional job opportunity. It's not compulsory workfare. So <coughs> workfare means you're already getting welfare benefits, but now we're going to make you work for them. That's workfare. We're not doing that. Whatever welfare programs already exist, we're not changing them. You still get your welfare if you don't want to participate in the program. It's not a handout or make work. It's not temporary, not based on my route. And it's not, our proposal is not for infrastructure. So some people have said, the U.S. needs $3 trillion of public infrastructure investment just to repair what we already have. That's not going to bring us up to China. Okay, we're still going to be way behind China. But it, at least our bridges wouldn't fall down. That's $3 trillion. So people say, even Trump says, we need public infrastructure investment. Okay. Most of our jobs are not going to be infrastructure. There could be some, but most won't be. The, the, the people who think you can use this program for infrastructure don't understand how infrastructure is done in the U.S. It's done by union labor. You can't take away union jobs. You can't take away, they're also done by the private sector that's hired by the government to build the bridge. Okay? Governments don't build bridges in America. It's always the private sector. You can't take those, uh, that work away from the private sector in the United States. It's politically impossible. So we're not proposing that. It's full employment, a softer business cycle, secure wage floor and labor standard. Uh, distressed areas are naturally targeted because the jobs are created where the unemployed are. So you are targeting the poorest parts of every community. Okay, so the poorest neighborhoods in the city are the ones that will get the jobs because that's where the unemployed are. Um, Pre-distribution, uh, we're going to increase the wage share directly. We're not using redistribution, you know, which is tax the rich and give welfare to the poor. It's pre-distribution, you increase wages. Prevention, not just cure. Uh, recognizes the social cost of unemployment, provides jobs. Um, our proposal differs from others, so several other proposals have come forward. I'm not going to go through those. Uh, but uh, ours is very simple. Uh, 
everyone gets the same wage. Some proposals want to try to pay higher wages to higher skilled workers. We think that that's a, a mistake because then you're competing with the private sector. We don't compete with the private sector. We pay $15 an hour in the program. The private sector will have to pay $15 an hour or more, but we don't bid against the private sector. If you want to hire a skilled worker for $30 an hour, we don't say, well, we'll pay $35. Okay? We're not going to bid them away. Everyone gets $25. Whether they're a doctor, a lawyer, they're going to get, uh, sorry, $15 an hour, no matter what, no matter what they are. Um, high quality anchor versus the tiered wage, wage structure that is different wages. Less disruptive impact on the private sector employment of wages. Uh, it's true that if you raise the wage to $15 an hour, there's some disruption there. Private sector has been paying, let's say, $7.50 an hour, the, the basic minimum wage. They're going to have to pay $15. That's a disruption. It's a one-time jump of wages, which is going to cause some of them to raise their prices. And some of them will go out of business. Some will just say, I can't pay $15 an hour. Okay. Some will go out of business. Now, we don't know exactly how many. We, we have put that in to the simulation that I'm going to uh, talk about. Uh, but if you compare, well, first, it's going to be phased in. The proposals to raise a minimum wage raise them in steps until uh, 2022. That's when we hit $15 an hour. So we would phase this in the same way. Uh, the, the steps that are phased in are a little higher than the way we've uh, raised minimum wages in the past. So the, the percentage increase of the wage at each step is a little bit higher, but not very much higher. When we raised the minimum wage in the past, a few firms go out of business. However, other firms hire more labor. Why do they hire more? Because when wages are higher, people can consume more and their sales go up. Okay. The, there are lots of empirical studies of what happens when you raise minimum wages. Um, what a lot of these do is they focus on, say, New Jersey raises their, minimum, their state minimum wage and Pennsylvania doesn't. And they look, in, look at the employment effects of the increase in New Jersey. What these studies find is that employment actually increases a little bit. Okay? It goes against neoclassical theory. Employment increases a little bit. Now, this is different from that because it's nationwide, it's $15 an hour, um, but it's just not plausible that the employment effects uh, on the private sector are going to be huge, that is, laying lot, off lots of workers. We assume that 25% of current low-wage employers will go out of business. 75% will be able to raise their wages, okay? And I, I think that that's pretty um, uh, consistent with what we observed in the past. And in our simulation, at $15 an hour, private employment actually goes up in the simulation. Okay? This is the result of the model. Why? Aggregate demand's higher. So the private sector actually increases employment. So net, you gain employment. Yes, you lose some employers. When people complain about that, I say, well, you know, if your business model requires poverty level wages, you should go out of business, right? I mean, if I could pay a dollar an hour, I could think of lots of employment where people are basically starving you can think of lots of things you could use them for, lots of business models that would be successful if you could pay dollar an hour wages. But we don't allow it. We don't allow it now. We require 750 an hour. 
and raising the minimum wage is normal. Over time, you gradually raise it. And it should rise in real terms. In the United States, it doesn't. Whenever we increase it, we're just catching up right, to inflation. But it should be rising in real terms. So I'm not that worried about businesses that have to go out of business because they have bad business models. They should go out of business. <laughs> if they can't think of a way of paying wages that are higher than what Vietnam pays, they shouldn't be operating in the US. They should go to Vietnam. And Vietnam should be raising wages too over time. Um, where I like. uh, greater economic stability, uh, lower inflationary impact than the other proposals. Ours are locally run, not federal government, and they're not just Okay, uh, you're not very interested in the details, so these kinds of details. How do you do it? We would do it through the Department of Labor. And then um, the, uh, the funding comes from the Department of Labor, but states and municipalities uh, will be the second layer down. They will uh, accept proposals. They're going to uh, check the projects, evaluate them, make sure they're successful. Uh, the unemployment offices become employment offices. So rather than handing out unemployment checks, what they do is they have lists of people who want jobs. The um, employers come there and they try to recruit from among the unemployed. The employers are public institutions, community groups, uh, non-governmental organizations, and social entrepreneurial uh, ventures. Also, possibly, they could be worker co-ops. Uh, Pavlina is the one who's worked on this. Uh, it would be called the National Care Act. It had, there are three kinds of uh, uh, job categories, care for the environment, care for the community, care for the people. You can see most of our jobs are going to be service sector jobs. Some kind of service. Servicing the environment, community, people. Care for the environment. You can read this on your own. These are examples. Care for the community, care for the people. Okay. Um, there have been several polls uh, uh, in the United States, and they typically are finding above 50% supporting job guarantee, even when uh, it's phrased, uh, the federal government will guarantee uh, and provide a job to anyone who wants to work. Okay, even that gets above 50% which given the hostility Americans have toward the federal government is amazing. It gets 50%. The people who ran this poll said they had never gotten such positive responses to any poll they had ever given. It was positive everywhere in the country. It was positive with Republicans. Okay. Far more supported it than opposed it. They had never had a poll like this before, they said. Um, Positive impacts on employment, national output, poverty rates, state and local government budgets, manageable effects on the federal budget. Of course, we don't believe that it matters. The government can't run out of money, but everybody else does. So we have to report what the budget effects are and the inflation. Um, Scott Fulweiler is the one who uh, ran the simulations. He works with the FAIR model all the time. FAIR model is an orthodox model that's uh, commonly used in the U.S. for policy analysis. So we're using an orthodox model, not one we, not an MMT model. If we had an MMT model, the results would have been much better. Okay, so this does not have the employed buffer stock effect. It's not in there, okay, because FAIR doesn't believe in that. It has a NIRU. It has a Phillips curve, okay? So it's biased toward inflation because we're going to be eliminating unemployment. It's biased toward inflation because it doesn't have the employed buffer stock. Uh, the FAIR model even did well in the global financial crisis, which is surprising. <coughs> it cranked out results, you know, a couple quarters ahead that actually fit very well. It was maybe the only model that did well. 
program pays fifteen dollars an hour. Um, skip that. Average work week is thirty-two because there's a mixture of full and part-time. So this just reflects the existing distribution of full versus part-time in the U.S. Non-wage benefits are twenty percent. That is health care and child care. Those are the two big ones. Materials and other costs are twenty-five percent of wages. So every project is going to have some other expenses. The federal government will uh, give you an amount equal to 25% of your wage bill. So if you're spending 100 on wages for the employees in the program, you get another 25 for materials. We uh, don't recommend paying for supervisors and so on accounting services, all that stuff, because these organizations already have supervisors, they already do accounting, we, we don't want them uh, to uh, create brand new projects and hire all the supervisory staff that they will need. What we want is them to, they already do something positive for the community. What we are proposing is, we ask them, how much more could you do if you could hire a few more workers? Okay? And we will pay the wages and some materials costs. So you can do more of the good work you're already doing. That's our idea uh, for the most part. Um, the real world implementation would be phased in, as I already said, but for the simulation, we do it all at one time. So immediately it goes to $15 an hour, and all wages rise that amount. Again, this biases it toward inflation. It's a jump from 750 minimum to 15 minimum. Now I have to tell you, around the US, in cities, and the East Coast, and the West Coast, nobody pays the minimum wage. The minimum wages are already a lot higher than the federal minimum either because the state has a higher minimum wage, the city has a higher minimum wage, or it's just not possible to hire people at 750 an hour, okay? So the, the, the jump isn't as high as it would be if everyone's paying 750 an hour. Uh, in the middle of the country, in the south, they do pay 750 an hour, so there will be a big jump there. People said, well, why don't you have a lower job guarantee wage there? I said, because we want to raise their wages. We want to increase their aggregate demand. You know, Appalachia would have coffee bars if everyone earned at least $15 an hour. Okay, they, people would be able to afford to go get coffee. Right now they can't. There aren't any coffee bars because everybody's poor. Why are they poor? Because the wages are really low. So no, we don't want to penalize places that are already poor. We want everyone to get $15 an hour. Um, pretty much already talked. Uh, you can read this. This is a, 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 about how many firms are going to go out of business. Model simulated. Okay, we had four uh, simulations. I'm going to focus on the one that uh, is most biased against us. Okay, uh, that is the most inflationary version of the model. The uh, um, for simulations, we have a higher bound and a lower bound of the size of the program. So what we had to do is we look at all the people who are not employed now or are involuntarily part-time who want full-time jobs. Okay? And we estimate how many of those will accept this job. So we, we have to divide up the out of the labor force into various categories and the part-time into var various categories and choose the categories that, where we think it's highly likely that people will choose the job, okay? If you're a, um, a, a woman with, you're a single mother, with two kids under age three, the probability you're going to take a full-time job is pretty small, okay, for example. Uh, so we, we put uh, probabilities on all of this to estimate how many people come in. 
we have a higher bound where more people come in and a lower bound where fewer come in. The higher bound comes out to be about 15 million. So 15 million will come in. Lower bound, I think, is something like 12. The higher bound will be more inflationary because you're hiring more people and increasing aggregate demand. So that's the one I'm going to report. Then we have simulation with the Fed turned on and the Fed turned off. Okay, what do I mean turned on? Turned on, the Fed raises interest rates to fight the inflation it thinks will occur because of the program. Turned off, the Fed doesn't raise rates. Okay? The, the turned on uh, will lower inflation but increase the size of the program. Okay, why? The Fed can no longer cause unemployment. It can raise interest rates as high as it wants. It cannot cause any unemployment because everyone can go into the program. All it can do is move people out of the private sector into the program, that is, into the government sector. It will completely change the Fed's behavior, I believe. Because right now, what they do is they move people out of the private sector into unemployed. That is what they do. Okay? And that's what they're trying to do. They say, we want fewer people working in the private sector, we want them unemployed. So let's raise rates. Now what they're doing is increasing the size of the government. Okay? So if they say there's inflation danger, what we're going to do is move more people into the government sector. Well, politically, that's a very different issue. The private sector say, hold a second. You're going to take our workers away and put them in the government sector? We don't like that. Don't raise the interest rate. Okay? I think it's going to change the politics of the Fed a lot. But anyway, we have both of those. Um, so these are the... Um, the bigger program, but the Fed turned off, which will also uh, reduce the impact on the uh, budget, where the Fed turned off. Um, because the government won't have to pay a higher interest rate on bonds. So there, in that respect, this is benefiting us a little bit, but the difference isn't very big. It's like $30 billion of uh, not having to pay the higher interest rate on bonds without having to fed it. <clears throat> the stimulus from the program creates 4 million private sector jobs. So we're creating 19 million jobs. 15 in the program, 4 million in the private sector because of higher aggregate demand. 5 million workers come into the program from each of the three main labor force categories. Five million come from un currently unemployed. Five million from involuntary part-time employed. And some from those firms that go out of business. And five million from out of the labor force. Um, the peak boost to real GDP is almost 600 billion a year. The increase of inflation, it peaks at 0.74 percentage points. 0.74, less than 1%. So inflation goes up from about 2% to 2.7%. This is with 19 million new jobs and 600 billion more in output. Okay. It's insignificant, and that's the peak. It gradually declines because it's a one-time jump to the wage. The system adjusts. They increase output. Inflation declines down to the... Um, uh, point zero 0.09. You can barely measure it. Okay. Now this is relative to the base. There already is inflation, right, in the base model. Add the job guarantee, inflation will be a little bit higher in the beginning, and then it declines to really no higher than it was without the program. The federal spending rises, tax revenue also rises, so the net increase in the budget deficit is about $400 billion a year, which is 1.5% of GDP. Now, of course, we're not concerned about that. Uh, other people are, but it's not that big. The, in the past, people have tried to um, project what the impact on the budget deficit would be. Generally, 
the uh, estimates for a wide variety of countries of a job guarantee program is between two to three percent of GDP. Okay, that would be the budgetary impact. Our program, using a well-established model, running a simulation rather than just you know doing it on the back of an envelope, comes out to one and a half percent of GDP. So this is very small. Now, the model doesn't put in cost savings. So this is without very many of the cost savings you would get of having full employment. Okay? Uh, there's a, we put in a little bit of Medicaid saving. Medicaid is our health care for really poor people. It's not a very good health care, but they get some if you're really poor. So we included some savings there because a lot of those poor people are going to have jobs. They're going to get full health care in this program. We included all of the costs of the health care, but only some of the savings of health care. Um, we didn't include a lot of um, welfare. We did include a little bit, but not very much. We included some... Uh, Earned income tax credit savings. This is a, a, a tax credit you get if your income is low and you're working. Income would be higher because you're going to get $15 an hour now. There's a little bit of saving. So we included some savings, but not very much. Our next step is to try to incorporate more of the cost savings that you will get from the program. So it's very likely the number is going to turn out to be much less than 1.5%. It's not impossible that it's going to turn out to be zero, the net budgetary impact. Now, the health care alone could easily make this program zero. The reason is because in the U.S. we spend 17% of GDP on health care. 17%. And the federal government, I believe, is about one-third of all of that. Okay. The, uh, a universal health care program would lower health care spending from 17 to probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 9% of GDP. We would then be more in line with other rich developed capitalist countries. Uh, it could decline even more than that if we can get Americans more healthy than they are, which could happen if you have access to health care. You know, if you start getting health care uh, before you get serious problems like diabetes, uh, it's possible that the reduction could be even more than that. State budgets actually improve by $53 billion a year. Their tax revenue goes up because the economy is doing better. Uh, we underestimate the cost. Uh, uh, just quickly, you can look at the graphs. Here is the employment, the low and high um, uh, assumptions. Here is additional real GDP, private sector jobs, the increase of inflation, you can see the peak and then declining, impact on the federal budget, state budgets. Last topic is um, uh, poverty rates and um, the impact on uh, minorities and women. This table just shows you that uh, minorities and women, well, minorities and especially minority women uh, benefit disproportionately. A higher percent than they have in the population go into this program. Why? Because there's discrimination in the private sector. So they will benefit more than proportionally. Um, poverty rates uh, in the U.S., the poverty rates for individuals between 18 and 64. If they had no work, it's 30%. If they work part-time, it's 15%. If they work full-time, it's 2%. What did Minsky say? Okay, a job is the best program against poverty. We see that in the data right now. If you have a full-time job, even with a minimum wage at only $7.50 an hour, you only have a 2% probability of being below the poverty line. Poverty rates for families with children, Today, families with no workers the, uh, have a poverty rate of 90%. So 
So without a job, if you have children, your family's going to be in poverty. Part, families with one part-time worker, 57%. Families with one full-time worker, 10%. You can see how dramatically the poverty rate goes down with jobs. Now that's before the program. With the program, we're paying $31,000 a year. It'll lift 10.6 million children under 18 out of poverty if one member of the household works. If two members work, one full-time, one part-time, so that would be typical if you had uh, two parents, all 15 million children living in poverty could be raised out of poverty. Now, they have to take the jobs, right? There's nothing automatic. If they don't take the jobs, they don't get out of poverty. The opportunity is there. This program could eliminate poverty if they alter the jobs. That's it. So I don't know if you want to save questions. Take a few. Yeah. So, Professor, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm, I'm very curious about the, 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 the problem of the all the idea behind it. And, but especially now, I think that you point some of the, the positive effects uh, of, this, of this implementation, of this plan. Uh, but I'm curious about the unintended consequences that it could have on the economy. Uh, for example, is this model like sectoral? Uh, do, did you consider like the different industries in, in the United States that uh, use the capacity and etc. How like uh, detailed is this model? Okay, to describe your economy. So, the the fair model and fair has models for many many countries. Uh, I imagine there's one for Brazil. I can't say for certain, but. Uh, all the big countries he has a model. They're not all as detailed and they don't all have the same track record as the US because he's been doing it for the US since the early 70s. The US uh, generally has better data than most countries. So more data series, so he has access to a lot more data. So it's a much fuller model for the United States. And so uh, he he has a Phillips curve in there. So what happens when you increase employment by 20 million? Okay, based on historical empirical data, what would be the result to the boost to aggregate demand? That's all based on history. So does he divide it, you know, down to three-digit SIC codes? No, it's a macro model. Okay, so it's just based on what has happened in the past when you create lots of new jobs and more aggregate demand, what happens to the unemployment rate and what happens to the inflation rate. So that's what it does. So it's based on history. Yeah, but, but you know, it also doesn't consider so, I, I, I think, uh, different best of goods of consumption for each class or each employee class. For example, the very poor consumption consumes some basket of goods and the middle class consumes another one and uh, it, it doesn't see like a uh, disaster, right. like, for example. Yeah. So I, I'm asking all that because uh, uh, I, I think that uh, maybe there are some complexities or some unintended consequences that may have affect the overall result and I, I will uh, ask you to see it well. Uh, how could you cope with that, or how would you prevent that? Yeah. For example, uh, probably we would have like some redistribution of wealth among different classes in uh, uh, the United States, and not only from like the the point dot one percent from the, the most richest to the uh, ten percent uh, most poor, but maybe for the middle class and etc. and of course, when you also uh, give some wealth to the unemployed, obviously you increase the, the, the wages from the existing uh, employed persons, for example. So this may cause the overall uh, uh, productivity of the U.S. employee to go down. But on the other side, if it could be uh, increased if the, the overall exchange rate 
uh, goes up, for example, and then uh, the, the, the dollar buys less, for example. But uh, how, how would uh, the administrators, the managers of these plans, cope with that, with that, that there are possible consequences, for example? You have, for example, outsourcing, more enterprises going to China, uh, or more uh, advanced employees like uh, uh, in the high tech industries going abroad? Well, the, uh, the high tech is not going to be affected very much by this. Uh, this is, it's, it's taking workers they're not going to hire anyway. And the, as you raise the wage at the bottom, the firms that are most affected are the ones close to the bottom. Okay? They're going to have to raise their wages to compete. The, uh, there could be a little bit of an impact, higher aggregate demand, uh, could tighten, the labor market's at the top too, so it's not directly related to what you're paying, the base wage, the people in the program, and the ones whose wages are really close. But the higher aggregate demand could lead to some price and wage pressure at the very top. That's what this model is capturing based on history. Okay, what happens when aggregate demand goes up? What's the impact on wages and prices? And um, the impact is very small. Overall, we're not singling out what happens in every industry. I, I can't answer that question. The model doesn't give us that. Um, but note that a lot of your questions are based on this specific proposal, not the job guarantee. Okay, because you can implement the job guarantee without raising the base wage. We could have said, let's simulate and propose a program that pays 7.15 now, which is the current minimum wage. In that case, you're not directly pressuring the wages at the very bottom, okay? And because you're not removing these people from the private sector, uh, you're, you're not tightening their labor market either because they can pay $7.51 an hour and hire workers out. They're still available as a reserve army. They're just employed, not unemployed. Um, the boost to aggregate demand, there will still be some <laughs> because if before you were unemployed, you were living on welfare, you were living on uh, relatives and family and so on, now you have a job at $7.15 an hour, there will be some boost to aggregate demand. It's not gonna be nearly as high as this one. Uh, so a lot of it has to do with where we're setting the wage and this is a policy variable okay why did we choose 15 because that is our national movement that is where we are going why did we give them health care we could have said no we're not going to provide health care because the United States doesn't provide health care right now uh, in that case, the impact would be smaller. So what I'm saying is, when you implement the program, you can decide how much you want to impact the economy. Okay. This is a very progressive proposal. We are purposely raising the standards. Now, I can't answer your questions based on the model. I can answer your question based on what I believe about the U.S. economy which is that we have massive excess capacity throughout the economy and that we will very easily handle this increase. That we've sort of gotten used to operating way below our means. Like a lot, some people say, you're living beyond your means, how can you tell? Well, because we have a budget deficit. That means we're living, be no, we're living way below our means. If we look at what the U.S. has been able to do in the past, uh, gearing up from the Great Depression to World War II, what we were able to do in that period, um, we can do again. It's actually much easier now. In the 1930s, the U.S. was a developing country. People think we were a rich country. We were not a rich country. We were a developing country. 
Huge parts of America didn't have electricity. Huge parts of America didn't have indoor plumbing. Uh, didn't have schools. The, uh, during the um, New Deal, we built hundreds of thousands of buildings using a, a lot of people who didn't have very much skill at all. We didn't have public infrastructure in large parts of the country. We didn't have highways in, 19, in the 1930s. Um, we didn't have airports all over the country. We have all those things now. now they're starting to all fall apart. Okay. Uh, but we can pretty quickly, we can put them back in order. So our, we live so far below our capabilities. It's very hard to even know what we're capable of because we don't try. When they do, once in a while, a, a government will do a survey. And the, they'll have, you know, how much could you increase your production if there was a demand? You find out typically it's about 50%. Firms say, yeah, 50%. If the demand was there, what's holding you back? Well, there isn't a demand for it. Um, and then finally, when uh, I go to China and see what the Chinese could accomplish so rapidly, going from uh, you know, such a state of poverty and underdevelopment to some parts of their economy most developed on Earth so quickly. Why can't a developed country do that? It just doesn't make any sense to me. We have relatively highly educated population. We know how to do things, and we have the resources to do them. The resources we don't have, we can buy. So I think it's perfectly feasible for us to ramp up production to take care of the extra demand that this will generate. The extra demand is, is half a um, sorry, half a trillion. Half a trillion, I was going to say half a billion. It's half a trillion increase of GDP. Okay, can we do that? Yeah, we can do it. I'm confident we can. But every nation, when you implement it, you do have to consider those things. I agree. So could um, uh, Brazil pay the equivalent of $15 an hour? Probably not. Okay, you don't want to start there. You want to start somewhere lower than that. Or you say. Okay, so I want to go back to the political economy uh, perspective. Um, so you mentioned the brilliant Kalecki paper, the classic one, and then you mentioned that um, there are two uh, uh, problems with classicism. If you take it from a, a progressive uh, point of view, but I would ask you if uh, you don't think that there is a um, message on, on the bottom of Kalecki's paper that is um, and how you, you assess that. The message is that you know, the elite doesn't care about who yeah. So for them, it's, it's, they just don't care. And uh, on the opposite side, they prefer. Yep. And so this is one thing, and the other thing is a curiosity, um, because you were mentioning, you said that you are on the track of Minsky and that Minsky wrote and, and researched a lot about poverty and unemployment in the beginning of his career, and also you mentioned, and I've read a lot, that Minsky has a background, an institutionalist background, so before becoming a Keynesian, he was trained in uh, Chicago as an institutionalist. But uh, um, uh, I have a curiosity, and uh, I didn't uh, hear about Minsky, and uh, um, an influence, maybe an influence of uh, Marx in Minsky. So, is there an influence um, in the uh, economic perspective, political perspective? <laughs> well, okay, I'll start with that one. So his uh, parents met at uh, a celebration of Marx's birthday. They, they were both Mensheviks. Um, so Minsky was, was raised in a uh, Marxist Menchevik, Menchevik type, though, home. Um, and he was involved 
with uh, far left-wing uh, political groups. Uh, in California, I don't remember the, the name of it, but uh, he was a member of and uh, uh, gave advice to the most left-wing uh, part of the California Democratic Party, which is more left-wing than most of the states. Um, he, uh, when he was a um, student of Douglas, um, there were uh, some radical groups on campus, and Minsky reported himself that Douglas asked him to participate and keep an eye on them. Uh, Minsky was definitely anti-Soviet Union, and so I think the idea was that he should be watching to see if these groups were going Soviet. Uh, when he was uh, in the military uh, posted in Germany, um, he also reported that uh, his role was to try to influence the German labor unions uh, to go in a liberal, not a Soviet, uh, direction. Uh, so yes, he was very left-wing, uh, but um, politically, uh, you know, Menshevik or anti-Soviet uh, leanings, and um, he rarely wrote about Marx, he did occasionally, uh, Marxist theory, occasionally. Um, I think that he had a very good understanding of Marx, but he didn't teach it, and he really didn't talk about it. When, when I was in his office and, and uh, we would go that direction, uh, he would always say things to let me know he knew, um, but we wouldn't go there. And I, I think that uh, it was um, for survival reasons. Uh, you know, the 50s when he came out <laughs> was the McCarthy period, and he knew that uh, the reason he couldn't get promoted at Brown was because of his politics. Martin Mayer discovered that the reason that he could not get a pay increase at Berkeley, which is why he left, they would not match, they wouldn't even come close to matching offers he was getting, uh, was because the president of the university was intervening because Minsky was too radical. So there were really consequences of uh, uh, being a, a radical economist. And uh, he was careful. So I think that that was it. He, he said he moved, he took the job at Washington University. I don't think he knew that the president had intervened. Uh, Martin Mayer discovered uh, a letter. Um, I, so I'm not sure Minsky knew that. But he said he moved to Washington University for peace and quiet, and, and pretty much, you know, he was out of that kind of politics at Washington University from, um, when did he go there? 69, I think. Something like that. So long before I started studying, he, he just really wasn't doing that. He, he was giving advice to Democrats uh, in his uh, files or papers. Uh, Hubert Humphrey, who was the vice president, and many of the people around Kennedy after Kennedy's assassination. Uh, Sergeant Shriver, who was the head of the war on poverty, uh, he wrote to lots of the Democrats, you know, mainstream Democrats, giving them policy advice. Uh, not really involved in radical anymore. Okay, uh, on the, um, the politics, well, uh, so the Democratic Party, um, the mainstream Democratic Party has exactly the same constituency of the Republican Party. There really is no difference. Uh, and the uh, DNC, Democratic uh, National uh, committee that is, you know, trying to get together this uh, 
next election, uh, clearly is not going to favor the job guarantee. Their problem is going to be that uh, the candidates who are uh, pretty likely to be the front runners will already have endorsed it. No matter what the DNC wants, it's going to, going to be in the platform. You can't have your main candidate uh, running against the Democratic Party platform. So it will be in there. Uh, national health care will be in there because these candidates are going to endorse it. The DNC will try to undercut them, just like they did with Bernie. Uh, but in spite of what the elite wants, and the DNC is trying to pursue, uh, I think the voters are going to revolt. And if the DNC gets its way, I think Trump will win again. If they, if they are able to um, neutralize Bernie uh, again, I think Trump will win. So it's a big risk. And I, I hope that they won't do that. Uh, Bernie's by far the most popular politician in America. And if he's healthy, I think he's going to run. And whether he wins or not, the other candidates are going to have to be very close to his proposals. That's why they've all come out in favor of the job guarantee, because they knew he was going to. They came out before he did. And it was all rumored that he would. People expect that he will. Um, he, he was waiting to have a very well-formulated uh, proposal. Uh, but they, they all started coming out before he did, supporting the job guarantee. So I, I think that it's, that you're absolutely right, but the problem is the voters are not happy. And they, uh, uh, some of them, you know, jump ship and went with Trump. There are quite a few Obama voters who voted for Trump. You say, that's just impossible. How could you imagine somebody who supports Obama is going to vote for Trump? Hmm. But the reason was because they didn't like what the Democratic Party was offering. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, depends on them, not me. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm, I'm aware of the importance of an immediate application of such a uh, job program, but I'm also concerned of the long, long run possibilities for such a program. You've mentioned uh, David Graeber's work. I'm very fond of his approach on motion jobs. And I'd like to know if there's any prospect of affecting these kinds of jobs. Uh, I understand its goal is to combat unemployment right now in the best way possible. But thinking of the possibilities for our grandchildren, is it feasible? Is it being considered uh, the usage of such a program to reduce your working hours for sure. example? Well, whatever this program offers is going to have to be matched in the private sector. So yeah, the, um, you're raising the wage and providing health care and child care. That's what our proposal does. If this program provides child care and that's important to you and the private sector won't give it to you, you can vote with your feet and move into this program. It's going to pressure the private sector to provide child care. It's going to pressure the private sector to provide health care. We thought about putting two weeks paid vacation in this program. Believe it or not, the, in the United States, there is no such thing as required vacation or paid vacation. It doesn't exist in the U.S. Put it in this program, there will be pressure on that. Anything you put in the program. Reduce the work day to six hours. If this program does it, you know, without reducing your pay, if this program does it, the private sector is going to have to follow. So this is how you implement those things. 
You don't require it of the private sector. You just offer it in this program. Uh, so I think politically it's a little bit easier, but of course it's going to the business sector is going to rise up, going to put us all out of business if we have to give health care. Okay, something like that, which could well be true. I'm sympathetic to that argument. What's the solution? The government has to provide health care to everybody, right? The private sector will demand it. They say, look, you're giving it to these workers. We can't afford it. Suddenly, there will be a movement by the private sector for national health care. I, I, I predict that absolutely will happen. If this program, if a bill is passed, there will be immediately a movement by the business sector for national health care, and we'll solve that problem. We'll just take it out of this program. Everybody will get it. Um, same thing with everything else you mentioned. You know, reducing the work week, there will be a movement for it. If this gets it, the private sector is going to demand it because the workers will demand it. So that, that's how you improve uh, the labor standards all over society. The crappy jobs, who will take them? If the job is really crappy, who's going to take it? They're going to go into this program. Okay, so if you have jobs where people feel like they're doing something useful, they're doing things for their community, they, they go to work and feel proud of what they're doing, who's going to want to flip hamburgers? Probably nobody, which is good. Either people can stop eating hamburgers or robots can do it. Which is, you know, robots easily could do this work. So that's what will happen. So that's how you um, make jobs better by giving good jobs here. That's why I said good jobs and good pay. Jobs have to be good. So people will say, well, how can you guarantee all these jobs will be good? I can't guarantee they will all be good. What is necessary is that you have um, community service organizations that are committed to what they're doing. They will create good jobs. There will be pressure on the other providers of these jobs to also do something useful. So it will come from the ground up. They will force people, the, the job creators, to be creative, to do things that the community really wants. So that's why I think decentralizing is good. If you put it all in the federal government and you have the labor department trying to formulate programs all over the country that are good jobs, that are serving the community, people feel good going to work, it's not going to work out. They're not going to be able to do it. Decentralize and let creative people um, create the projects. Oh yeah, you have yeah. So uh, you've been using uh, the mainstream model, that mainstream model, uh, which has been quite a clever move, I think. Uh, but what about uh, our fellow uh, mainstream economists? Um, how is the dialogue with them in the case there's any? And just a speculative question, uh, suppose that the uh, Democratic candidate uh, does endorse the, the program. Uh, how do you think that uh, uh, economists, the, uh, the liberal economists of the Democratic Party would, would react? Would they all become Republican? Would they reject the, the, the program or what? Well, on the, uh, the, the model, so we've got some responses and uh, uh, after we uh, issued this report I wrote a response to the critics, so people like Dean Baker. They they had not carefully read what we did. So uh, the answers were already in our report to some of the criticism. Um, when I presented the Levy Institute, there was a, a guy there who works with the FAIR model, and um, he, his belief was that uh, the FAIR model might be biased downward on the inflation. He wasn't completely convinced by this. And I, uh, Scott is the one who knows the model really well, and he wasn't there. So it's, uh, that's the only one that I know of that came from a mainstream person. He thought the inflation 
it was probably biased downward because of the nature of the model. I can't answer that. I don't know enough about what it is. The, my response is that inflation is biased downward in the past 20 years. It's very hard to get inflation in the developed countries because of the competition from Asia, uh, India, and China. That it's, it's going to be very hard to get inflation in a country like the United States or in most of Europe. Uh, so uh, I'm not convinced it's by stock. It also doesn't have the buffer stock, the employee buffer stock impact of uh, rolling down uh, wages in the private sector. So we do get the initial boost, but then we have something that prevents wages from rising further. If we keep the wage at $15 an hour, which we do in the model, it's kept at $15 an hour through 2022. So there's no um, uh, wage price spiral coming from this program. And uh, the, uh, the FAIR model can't really fully account for, for the wage stabilizing impact because it doesn't model the impact of an employee buffer stock. It just models this as we've increased general employment and it makes no difference whether it's in the job guarantee or in the private sector as far as this model goes. They have the same impact on inflation, so we can't really model that. Um, I'm hoping that uh, the other people who are uh, proposing the job guarantee We'll also do some simulations, so we'll have more than one, and hopefully they'll use something other than fair, so that we can try to, uh, uh, you know, do a compare, compare and contrast the outcomes using different models. But right now, this is the only one. The uh, Sandy Darity and Derek Hamilton have a proposal that. Um, comes up with just about the same number of people, 15 million. They have a tiered wage structure, so their impact on the budget is quite a bit bigger than ours because there will be wages that are much higher than $15 an hour. Um, uh, I, I don't think they have a model to do the inflation yet. They have um, GDP and budget and employment impacts. But as far as I know, we're the only ones who got inflation. Any other questions?